uh, I want to thank you all. Thank you all for coming today. This is really quite a sight. Um, I'm very excited that we have so many legislators, uh, such support from advocates, from survivors here today. We are here to talk about common sense gun violence prevention legislation because we are here. Yes. We are here because Connecticut has always led the way. We are here because we are trying to protect our families, our children, our spouses, our loved ones from the plague of gun violence. And all of the people in this room and the legislators and elected officials are here because they support common sense gun violence prevention laws. So. So I want to thank. I want to thank Connecticut Against Gun Violence. I'm Jeremy Stein, the executive director of Connecticut Against Gun Violence. Um, I want to thank moms. Are the moms in the room today? Yeah. Um, I want to thank Moms Demand Action and Kate Martin for, for uh, um, helping with this coalition for coming together. Um, I want to thank Poe Murray from Newtown Action Alliance. As well as Sandy Hook Promise. Uh, we, ha we know in Connecticut that the way to do this is together. And we can solve this problem together. So we have some gun bills to pass this session that have all passed judiciary. We have two safe storage laws. We have a ghost gun and 3D printer ban, and we are hoping that the people behind us can help us pass all of them so we have a safer Connecticut. What do you say about that, legislators? And now that they have passed judiciary, we need to call these bills early so they can get voted on it. So the gentleman to my right, uh, the Honorable Governor Ned Lamont, can uh, sign those into law. And without further ado, I would like to introduce from Mom's Demand, uh, Tara uh, Donnelly Godley. Jeremy. And on behalf of Moms Demand Action, thank, thank you to all of you for being here today. We are proud to stand with our coalition partners, Connecticut Against Gun Violence, Newtown Action Alliance, Sandy Hook Promise, and others at Connecticut's Gun Violence Prevention Advocacy Day. I'd like to briefly tell you why I'm here. In 2004, a man named Chris DeMeo was in the midst of of a spree of petty crimes, all committed to support a heroin addiction. For over a decade, these crimes consisted primarily of auto theft and home break-ins, until when robbing a home in Greenwich, he opened the drawer of a nightstand to find an unsecured 40 caliber pistol. Opening that drawer gifted a convicted criminal with a gun. It promoted those petty crimes to armed robbery. In just weeks, he used that gun to rob a jewelry store in Long Island, and in doing so, he shot and killed the owner, a father of two. Weeks later, he robbed another jewelry store, this time in Fairfield. He shot the owner, Tim Donnelly, five times, as his wife, of 30 years and high school sweetheart Kim watched in terror. It was a bullet to his heart that killed him, and it was the last thing that she saw. He then turned the gun on her, shooting her six times. She fought to live, but she died before paramedics could even get her to the ambulance. 
My name is Tara Donnelly Gottlieb, and I am their daughter. My mom fought hard to live that day. I am fighting hard to continue her fight. I used to think that their killing was a random act of violence, a senseless outcome of a robbery gone wrong. I no longer do. I think about the common denominator in the 100 people killed every day in this country because of guns. 100 people are not randomly dying every day. The answer is access. You cannot kill with a gun, and you cannot be killed with a gun without access. Chris DeMeo should not have had a gun. My parents should not be dead. If you do nothing to prevent it, it's not random. Today you'll hear from survivors like myself. We are asking you, we are calling you to act. We are collectively asking you to call House Bill 7218, 7219, and 7223. These are common sense bills with bipartisan support that are aimed at regulating ghost guns and requiring safe storage of firearms. If that gun in Greenwich was locked up, I wouldn't be standing here today before you as a survivor. I wouldn't be living my life without parents. We want to see funding restored to Project Longevity, a community and law enforcement initiative shown to, to reduce serious violence in New Haven, Bridgeport, and Hartford. The Project Longevity model has proven to reduce gun violence homicides by 35 to 60 percent. This program is working, and this is not the time to reduce funding. It is now my honor to welcome a man that does not need an introduction from me, but a man who I want to thank for being a champion of this cause, Governor Ned Lamont. Thank you, Tara. Uh, we're here to remind you you're not fighting alone. We're all here alongside of you and Jeremy. Your story, I've heard it, it resonates. Keep reminding us. To the moms out here, thank you. You keep reminding us. Don't let us forget. Do not let us forget. I see some students over here. Don't let your parents forget. Don't let those moms forget. You remind us every day. Like those kids at Sandy Hook, they remind us every day. And I think you're going to see some bipartisan support up here. Because here in Connecticut, which has been so touched by gun violence in the most personal way, uh, we know what this means. And yes, Jeremy, we are going to stay a leader on these issues. Uh, we are going to stay a leader. And I am going to pass those. I, you pass those bills, I will sign them the first day. I promise you that. Everybody used to tell me about gun show loopholes. I didn't realize that I can go on the internet, these things called ghost guns, and get an AR-15 delivered in five or six different pieces right across the border, delivered in 72 hours, no, no questions asked. Talk about a loophole. That is a gaping loophole that makes our society so much more dangerous. And I'm going to be working with our federal um, aid as well as what we can do here locally. That is something that's going to stop, and that's what this law will do. Three D guns, another extraordinary loophole. We can set the stage on that as well. Safe storage and what that means. These are accidents that are tragic, and we have to do more as a state to make sure that these uh, tragic, tragic accidents cannot be allowed to happen. Not in our state. Not in Connecticut. Look, I've been your governor for a little over a hundred days, and. One of the first things uh, I did was I found out about a shooting in Bridgeport. And uh, 
It was a young boy. I think he was 12. He had uh, just gone down to the corner to get some candy, coming back, ready to do his homework. Folks there in the house, and there was a random drug sh uh, shot from across the street, and he was uh, shot dead. And uh, I, I was there for that memorial service a week later, and you see what that does to a family, you see what that does to a community, and you see what that does to a state. We are in this together. We are one big community. And when we find shots like that that happen, they impact all of us. So that's why everybody is standing up here. That's why we're unanimous. That's why you're going to get these laws passed. And I wanted to say thank you for keep coming back, Moms Demand Action. You keep coming back. You remind us. You know that this is an issue that we're going to stay leadership on as long as we possibly can. And I'm proud to be standing next to you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, next, I would like to um, introduce our Attorney General, William Tong. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Jeremy, and thank you for all of the activists who are here today, and, and thank you, Governor. Uh, and thank you both for reminding us why we're here. We are here because Connecticut has always led on these issues. We're here because of all of you. But let me tell you why I'm here. I'm here because yesterday I picked up my phone and Facebook tells you whose birthday it is. Um, and I saw that it was Mary Jackson's birthday yesterday. Mary Jackson, who left a mark on all of us because of her advocacy and also because of her tremendous suffering with the loss of her daughter, Lori. Um, we're here this morning because of Kristen and Mike and because of Ethan. And I will tell you, there's been a lot of discussion in my job about national emergencies. There are some national emergencies that I think are real and some that I think are imagined. I can tell you where there is a national emergency, where I've seen the national emergency. There's a national emergency in Newtown, in Newtown Town Hall just a few weeks ago, a national emergency that persists in that great community. There's a national emergency in Guilford, in Mike and Kristen's home. There's a national emergency in every house and in every car in which a firearm is not safely stored. There's a national emergency on every computer where someone can just click and buy a ghost gun or acquire plans for a 3D printed gun. There's a national emergency in Stanford and Bridgeport and Hartford and New Haven too often for victims of urban violence. That's where there's a true national emergency and in times of great national emergency, all of us are called to action. Now, we've been called to action before. I look at my friends here in the room, the orange shirts, the green shirts, the red shirts. This is not our first rodeo together. But we have to do it again. And you know how this gets done. 76 and 19 and 1. 76 votes in the House, downstairs. 19 votes in the Senate down the hall and one signature. You've produced these votes before. Are you going to do it again? Yeah. 76 votes for safe storage, 19 votes for safe storage. Are you going to do it again? Yeah. Are you going to ban ghost guns? Are you going to ban 3D printed guns? Let's get it done. Thank you, William. Um, now that we're charged up, I'd like to introduce the uh, treasurer, Sean Wooden. Thank you. I'd like to say what he said. 
Um, so a, a, as introduced, I am your state treasurer. But uh, first and foremost, I actually stand before you as, as a father of two boys, um, as someone who's experienced the loss of a loved one to gun violence. I continue to be horrified, not only by the commonplace shootings that take place in our communities and in our country, but by the lack of political will at the national level to pass common sense gun control measures. Thankfully, our state has some of the strongest gun laws in the country. Thank you, William. Uh, thank you, former Governor Malloy. Thank you, legislators, for the work that you've already done. However, our work is not done. We need to keep looking for ways to address fundamental causes of gun violence. You've heard about a number of bills, uh, all of which I support. I'd like to focus on Project Longevity just for a moment, because I think it's critically important that we look at gun violence in all of our communities. And Project Longevity is something that does exactly that. It's been cited as a national model for its effectiveness, and the proof is in the numbers. Gun homicides in the three cities where Project Longevity has been focused, New Haven, Bridgeport, and Hartford, fell by more than 50 percent from 2012 to 2016. And let me tell you, these aren't just the statistics that I read about. I lived it as a city council president of Hartford during those years. But when the budget for the project was cut, gun violence has begun to surge in those communities. In Bridgeport, homicides increased by 52% in 2017. In Hartford, by 38%. And Waterbury saw the third most homicides in the state in 2017. We cannot let this trend continue. This is about young people. This is about young people, primarily in our communities. This is about lives. And I consider my obligation to those communities every day that I serve and to the lives that have been senselessly taken in Newtown, in Hartford, in Waterbury, in New Haven, all throughout our state and our country. To stand with Moms Demand Action and advocates throughout our state calling on the General Assembly to support Project Longevity and other gun safety legislation that is before them this is my honor and my obligation. And in Connecticut, we, we are leaders. We are leaders on this issue, and we will lead again. And as treasurer, I intend to be a leader in our state and nationally on these issues. I intend to hold gun companies in which Connecticut invests our pension fund dollars accountable for their products. And to take action against irresponsible gun manufacturers who refuse to do so. These companies must do their part to promote firearm safety, to support universal background checks, and to do whatever else they can to try to prevent their products from getting into the hands of those who would misuse them. That is the right thing to do, not only to minimize risk for our investment portfolio, but it is the right thing to do in our moral obligation for our communities and for our loved ones. Thank you.
now my pleasure to introduce the uh, President of the Senate, Mr. Martin Looney. Thank you. Thank you very much, and it's, it's great to see all of you here today for this day of advocacy. Uh, uh, I've been involved in, in pursuing common sense gun regulation for, for a long time, going back at least to 1993 when we passed the assault weapons ban uh, that year, and then of course in, in 2013 uh, with the significant national model legislation that we were able to pass after the tragedy uh, in Newtown. But it's, uh, it's never possible to rest and stand still because there are always new challenges that arise in this area, uh, partly driven by new technology. Obviously, the idea of guns that could be created by 3D printers were not in our, uh, in our purview until fairly recently. So the, the concern about ghost guns, uh, those that can be assembled after receiving parts through the mail, or those that can be assembled entirely uh, by the use of 3D printers, now have to come under the can of reasonable uh, governmental regulation. Uh, we have had safe storage laws in the past, but we need that some of the recent tragedies in, in Guilford and other places have pointed out that we need stronger safe storage laws. Those also uh, need to be pursued this year. So there is never uh, a time in which we can uh, address every possible contingency that may arise. We have to be constantly vigilant uh, and to keep that battle going. Now we hear from uh, advocates uh, who are opposed uh, to these uh, proposals, the idea that the, that the Second Amendment uh, should be a shield against all kind of, of regulation. But they misread constitutional law and the way in which the Constitution has been interpreted by the courts. The reality is that every constitutional right is subject to reasonable governmental regulation for public health and public safety purposes. Uh, as Justice Oliver <laughs> There is, there is no such thing as an absolute right to have access to every kind of gun in every possible circumstance. Uh, as Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said regarding the, uh, the First Amendment and the right to free speech, I think you would argue is the fundamental right in our Constitution. Even that is subject to reasonable regulation. When Justice Holmes said that uh, the First Amendment right to freedom of speech does not guarantee someone the right to yell fire in a crowded theater. So uh, the idea of public safety regulation, public health regulation, the reasonableness of that regulation uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the needs being created and the needs of the larger society, apart from the claims of the individual, always have to be balanced. Uh, and the Second Amendment should not be exempt from that balance. So I, again, thank all of you for being here today. The level of interest and advocacy, I think, uh, is important because, uh, as we know, there are uh, very well-funded interests that are arrayed against us uh, every year uh, when we seek to, uh, to introduce more reasonable uh, gun safety regulation. Uh, we can never, uh, never take for granted uh, that the level of opposition will not be uh, extreme, that they will not try to uh, twist the facts, create alarm, um, uh, create the appearance that we're seeking to undermine the Constitution or, or take away fundamental rights. Of course, none of that is ever true, uh, but never, that never stops them either. Uh, so we have to keep in mind that that's the context in which we battle, and I'm uh, greatly encouraged by the, the energy and the advocacy here today. Uh, all of the legislators here and our constitutional officers who were here, uh, many of them are for, uh, those who are former legislators, have been committed to this project uh, for a long time, and we will continue. Thank you. I'd like to introduce now the uh, Speaker of the House, Mr. Joe Arasemowitz, and the Majority Leader, Mr. Matt Ritter. Good morning. It's really our pleasure to be here today, and it's our pleasure to see so many of you here today um, advocating on behalf of the issues that you believe in and you feel strongly about are really important to our democracy. And this issue, I love the t-shirts. Moms demand action. I like it. It's, it's no longer asking. It's no longer talking. It's demanding. And I think that's something that should be, as we've been done in the past, a bipartisan issue. And it can be done in a rapid fashion. 
So I thank you for being here today. Make sure you engage with your state representatives. A lot of them are here from both sides of the aisle. Talk to them about the importance of the issues. And the next speaker is the one that's going to be putting it on the calendar. I know the Judiciary Committee has worked very hard to get these bills out. And I, they're, I think they're nearly ready for action or will be in the next couple weeks. So the next step is to continue to demand for the action. And the action will be putting them up on the board and making sure the House votes on them. So thank you for being here. So we we're putting no pressure on the House Chair, Representative Staffstrom from the great city of Bridgeport, but he's promised to move him along. And I'll just say this, at a time when our country uh, continues to face daily gun violence and the world continues to see it, quite frankly, Connecticut is a leader, and we've been a leader. And all of you have made a significant part in making us a leader. And so how about a round of applause for your advocacy and what you do? So in the sake of time, because I actually have a job to do on that floor down there, I will just say this. We are going to vote on these bills. We're going to get it done for you in the month of May. Call those reps, the folks who aren't there. Get them there. Let them know why it's important. We know the Senate will do it, and then we know our governor will sign it. So thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce uh, the uh, Senate Majority Leader, Mr. Bob Duff. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here today. You know, in some ways, our state and our country are divided like never before. You think of, you pick up the newspaper or you listen to the TV or watch the TV and you see a number of different issues of contention uh, in public, out in the public. But there's one issue, there's one issue that brings people together, and that is the issue of gun safety and gun reform. And those are the things that we have to make sure we continue to work on here in this legislature. Uh, Senator Haskell and Representative Dayton and I had a legislative forum back in January at Norwalk Community College, and there were people peppering us with questions left and right about any number of different issues. But as soon as the issue of gun violence prevention was brought up, People came together and they said, enough is enough. We need you to do more. Keep continuing to work on these issues. When we hit the doors last fall, we heard people time and time again saying, enough is enough. You need to do more. Make us safer. There's no reason why our children should go to school and feel unsafe going through those doors. There's no reason why somebody should go to the mall and not feel safe because there might be a shooting. There's no reason why somebody should go to a church and not feel safe and think that there could be a shooting. We have to do more to make sure that the public is safe and feel safe each and every day. So these bills that we have on gun storage, on ghost guns, on 3D printing are just common sense. These are the bills that our constituents want us to pass. They say to us, make us safer. Enough is enough. So I thank all of the coalition partners who are out here today and who are pushing us on these issues that are so important. Whether it's a suburban issue, an urban issue, it's an issue for all of the state of Connecticut. It's an issue for every single community throughout the state of Connecticut. We need everybody working together to reduce our gun violence in the state of Connecticut. And I just have to give a special shout out to the Moms Demand, because my mom goes to those meetings too. Um, and I don't know about you, but I never want to disappoint my mom. Because there, there'll be some hell to pay. So keep it up, and keep demanding action, and we'll keep passing it. And isn't it lucky that we have a governor who is so supportive, who is going to support and sign these bills. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 
I would like to introduce someone who is uh, very near and dear to my heart, who we've been working with very closely uh, this session, and a hero of mine, uh, Kristen Song. Please be where be. Another holiday has passed, and um, I was called the emotional hangover because you put on your armor for that day so that your other children and your family can get through the day. And my son remarked to me, who's 19, you know, Mom, this was the first year you didn't hide our Easter baskets because it's just, it's just too painful. Hello, darkness. There you are. I knew you were lurking in the shadows, waiting for me ready to envelop me when I least expect it, when I've taken off my armor, when my resistance is down. Yes, you lull me into a false sense of security, and then you cast your tentacles around my ankles, dragging me down into the abyss where it is cold and hopeless. This, sadly, is a day in the life of a person who has lost a loved one to gun violence. When my beautiful boy died, I was frantic to do something to keep other children safe, to spare one family from this devastation. I started looking at all the groups who are fighting to end gun violence. Brady, Gifford, Everytown, Newtown Action Alliance, Sandy Hook Promise, CAGB. I noticed that they all have the same goal, but different agendas. The NRA is counting, praying, hoping that we stay divided in our agendas, our messages, and our purposes. You see, if we stay divided, the NRA will win. The NRA's biggest fear is that all of us join shoulder to shoulder with one agenda, one message, and one purpose. This, my friends, is how you move mountains. The NRA is a machine pushing out one message. It has amassed wealth by spreading panic. It has been 20 years since Columbine. Are you happy with the gun reform so far? Are you willing to wait another 20 years for a safe, safer country? Well, I'm not. I refuse to turn around. I refuse to be denied. I have been knocked down so many times. I have been told that it was my fault, that my beautiful boy died. I have been trolled on social media. And you know what I say? Bring it on. makes me more determined. My heart may be broken and my body battered, but I will rise every time. This is not a journey for the weak of heart. Some will drop out of this fight, but for those of you who are ready to champion this cause, I ask you, I beg you, let us come together with a full force of every organization so that no more parents have to bury their precious children. Do it for Daniel, for Dylan, for Jessica, for Jamie, for Jamal, for Ethan, and the countless other children who have been killed by gun violence. This, my friends, is the dawn of a new day. Ethan's Law this year, aren't we? Yes. Yeah. And that wouldn't be possible with the help of people like uh, Representative Sean Scanlon, who introduced the bill, and also uh, our next speaker, uh, Representative Vinnie Candelora. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you uh, for inviting me to be here. Um, Kristen, I want to say, you know, we love you. Our heart breaks for what you have gone through. Um, but I'm here to share a, a, a story, I think a different story. Um, I do represent part of Guilford, and um, I have not voted for gun regulations in the past in this legislature. Um, despite that fact and my position on, on these issues, 
the Song family representative Scanlon approached me and had a conversation. And when Kristen talks about bringing us all together, uh, that's exactly what she did. And I think it's so important for us all to remember that this issue does not need to be divisive. It's obviously emotionally charged, but there's opportunities to bring everybody together into a room to have a conversation. And that's what we did with Ethan, Ethan's Law. Um, and what is remarkable, I think, about this legislation and what it represents um, is just not good gun reform, but it's representing people on both sides of the issue coming together for a common cause. Um, and that's, I think, a pathway um, that we should continue to move forward on, on gun reform. And the chairs of the Judiciary Com Committee, Representative Stastrom, and our ranking members on the Judiciary Committee um, have been phenomenal at bringing both sides of the aisle together. And both sides of the issue, you know, the, the pro-Second Amendment people and people that want gun regulation, to have that conversation. Because there is a way to make, um, you know, to, to help eliminate gun violence and certainly make our children uh, live in a safer environment. And so I am happy to stand here in support of Ethan's Law and hopefully we will have that bill passed soon. Thank you. So our next speaker is Jamel Dawkins. Jamel is the brother of Clinton Howell. Clinton Howell is a child that died in front of his house was, and, and his mother's here as well. Um, if you could come up and please share your story. Um. Okay, hello, I am Jamel Dawkins. And um, the night of December 18th, 2018, um, in Bridgeport, my little brother was shot and killed by gun violence um, due to a drive-by shooting um, that wasn't meant for him. And it devastated our family to the fullest extent, and we've, we haven't been the same since. Um, every day we have to live with that memory. Um, people see us, you know, they will say their condolences to us. Um, and it, and it just kind of brings it back every time. So I met Jeremy, um, and then I seen that, you know, he was trying to basically, you know, get gun reform. And I actually liked it because what he says can actually help, um, you know, future families from going through a travesty like that, um, as far as safe storage, anything, so it doesn't, you know, get in the wrong hands. But ever since that day, um, my mom, Definitely, I've been going, been living a nightmare, and it just haven't, haven't been any let up from it. So we had a lot of support um, from politicians to, you know, the community, everyone outside of Connecticut, um, everyone helped. It was very overwhelming, um, but that's something I know we're gonna have to live with for the rest of our lives. And we just take it day by day and hope that, you know, some laws could be changed to kind of help everyone in the whole, especially in Connecticut, to, you know, not go through anything like this again because it's something that you, it's hard to get over and it never feels the same, especially for holidays. And it was around his birthday, so it was really hard for us a week before Christmas. So, pretty much that's it. The next speaker I'd like to introduce is um, Deborah Davis, who is the mother of Philip Samuel Davis and also a representative of a very important organization that is unfortunately all too often um, forgotten about. Um, and they are a really important organization, especially here in Hartford. They are the ones that are the boots on the ground. They are the mothers 
that take care of the victims and the families here in Hartford. Uh, please give a round of applause for Mothers United Against Violence. I want to thank Connecticut Against Gun Violence. I want to thank Moms Demand Action. I want to thank all of the politicians and individuals from communities across the state that have come together not to just represent some, but to represent all. And one of the things that Mothers United Against Violence does is that we do a lot of collaboration. We know that your cause is our cause, and our cause is your cause. So we want to make certain that we stand at the front line in helping to reduce the gun violence in the urban area, in their inner city community. Because it's more critical to us because we experience it on a day-to-day -day basis. And sometimes it's not noticed. But we're here to let the governor know, to let other politicians know, and to let you know that we want to stand in front of this issue. And we want to make sure that it's reduced. And that's why Project Longevity is so important. But Mothers United Against Violence, because I have to speak on the organization that goes out to the front line, boots on the ground, impacting the family at the very beginning, and then staying with that family throughout the duration, as long as they need us. So it could be a day, a week, a year, but we're there. If they need services, we have to help them identify the services. And it's so important because those services need to be available for all of us. And so we try to identify those resources that really help to bring that compassion and to bring a lot of their prevention back into that household. And so it's so important that we stop the kind of senselessness with standing on your front porch and being an innocent victim and shot by a drive-by shooter. For us, that is senseless. We think that there's so many senseless acts that you potentially would not even know, but we lose children on a day-to-day -day basis for very things that are not even so relevant. And it could be the way they speak, the way they dress, the way they look. It could be in the wrong place, in the right place for them if they're in their park enjoying themselves, but at the wrong time. And so we have to realize that it's more work to do in our inner cities. We want to help you, and we want you to help us. We want to find those resources to bring this issue to the forefront. And I don't re just represent Hartford. I represent Philadelphia. I represent Los Angeles. I represent Miami. I represent Washington, D.C. We're the inner city, urban city moms that stand up, stand up for the front, on the front line for this cause because we need your support. We need your support more than what you'll ever know. And I know that with your support, we can make a difference. Part of our efforts is prevention. So we're out there making certain that the family is not in the mode of retaliation. These are very important elements, keeping the calmness, keeping the compassion, making sure that these individuals have what they need. Sometimes they can't find it, but thanks to groups like the Connecticut Against Gun Violence, Mom De Demand Action, Newtown Action Alliance, thanks to those groups that we have come together to help to identify the resources and kinds of legislation that will help the inner city on the prevention side for gun violence. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Jeremy wanted to make certain that for the first time in 11 years, we are doing our march, Mothers United Against Violence, in the inner city this time. And we're not going to the Capitol. Because on that Saturday, nobody's here. Although we will get meetings with everybody.
But more importantly, we're going to the stops in the inner city where we've lost lives, countless lives, senseless lives, for no reason, for no reason whatsoever. And so we want you to join us in our walk. We want you to join us in our march because we're fighting just like you are. When I lost Philip in 2010, I thought to myself, we did everything right. But then when I realized that it's not just us raising our children and bringing them up the right way, it's the individuals sometimes around them. And so we have to be even more vigilant than you do. And so it's a little bit of everything, everything that you can think of, walking, driving, everything that you can think of. So our plight is so much higher than what you can even imagine. And I know you've heard things, so I want to bring it home for you. This is a fight for the moms that are working to save our children across the board. And I thank you so much for your support. So if you haven't ever been to the Mothers Unite Against Violence March, which is a Saturday, this is an event you need to go to. Every person in this march carries a cross. And one each cross represents someone who's been lost to gun violence. There are so many crosses, there are not enough people to hold these crosses. There are not enough people to hold these crosses. How, that's how many people have fell, fallen victim to gun violence. So please, please support this very valuable organization. Uh, at this time, I am looking, I have a, sh a flow chart of who's here and who's not here. Um, uh, so I'm going to have Harold Dembo um, from Project Longevity, another really valuable, necessary program in the state of Connecticut. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I want to start off by saying this is very, very necessary what's going on here today. And it means a lot to us. Actually, me and the Quill are supposed to be in Washington, D.C. at the Gifford Law Center giving a speech on gun violence. But when we heard that this was going on, we take care of home first. <laughs> Next thing, I had a list of things I was going to talk about. I was going to tell you uh, all the data that's going on and it was already taken. <laughs> so yes, the uh, reduction, as was already said, is, was, is down 40% in Bridgeport. And the year that uh, we didn't have any money or no funding, uh, the crime rate went up. But one thing I wanted to tell you that we take this serious. We went seven months without getting paid just to keep the program alive and working. When we talk about lives, we're talking about everybody's lives. We're talking about the kids who are in school, the kids who was walking down the street. So I say, okay, well, now that everything that I was going to talk about is gone, what can I talk about? I say, well, everybody's saying Project Longevity. Well, let me tell you how we do it. That's different, right? <laughs> because everybody, Project, well, this is how we do it. We reach out to the family. We reach out to the suspect. We reach out to the victim. We literally go to the house. We knock on the door because we know that there's a reason. A little baby is not born and say, I'm going to get older and shoot a gun. Something went wrong in that household. And so one of our job is to go to that household, knock on the door, and find out what went wrong. Find out what is the problem. And then we try to work on fixing the problem. But we know we can't do it alone. So Connecticut against gun violence, Moms Demand Action. I met with a few of y'all. I think I'm coming down May 1st to speak at the Borough Center. Yeah. Okay. Right. See, I got help. <laughs> One of the main things that helped us go to is the community. Project Longevity works hard with the community. And the reason why this is important because who's in the community? The mothers with the sons. 
We just opened up a pop-up market on Stratford Avenue because one of the things, one of the problems we found out was on Stratford Avenue, it starts with a cemetery, ends with a graveyard. No library, no grocery store, nothing else there. So we also are concerned about the healthy of, of our children and what they're eating. So most mothers have to go to the next city just to grab some fresh vegetables. So we started a pop-up market where we're gonna have the food that's gonna be a box of food real cheap, maybe $10, and we can feed them better and, and can help them go to school and study longer. <laughs> we are meeting with moms as we speak. And these are the mothers that their child shot and killed the other mother child. So you have that different side of town going on. The, this person don't like this one on the north end because the one on the south end shot and killed. We're bringing them together because we have to find a way to stop the violence. We have to find a way to get everybody working on the same page. That's how we save lives. I'm a retired homicide detective. So when I hear about death, I seen plenty of it. And in Bridgeport, there was time when Bridgeport had 68 homicides. I was around. So I see hundreds and hundreds of homicides. And I had to go to the house. You know what it's like to go tell a mother that their son or daughter's not coming home? Can you imagine that? I gotta live with that. That's inside of me. So when I retired, I decided to continue doing the work that I was doing and keep fighting to bring down this gun violence because the life we save is a better world. Together we save lives. So I can't stress how important a organization like Project Longevity is. This is an organization that has been proven to reduce gun violence in cities by as much as 40%. By as much as 40%. So if you would like to get more involved in any of the organizations that you've heard about today, please visit the tables of Connecticut Against Gun Violence or Mothers Demand Action or Newtown Action Alliance. We will all be around afterwards to help you get more involved, to sign postcards, to give you to your legislators, to find out more information about some of the events that you heard today. Uh, and the last speaker that we are going to be hearing from who just left the room to vote, we'll be back in about 10 seconds, so I'm gonna ad lib a little bit, um, is Steve Stastrom, uh, who is the chair of the judiciary, who will be telling us about the next steps involved in what we need to do left for uh, the rest of the session. Uh, so uh, I want to thank everyone that has been here today. Um, this has been a really great showing of advocacy and to make sure that we have bipartisan support for all that we have done here is just an amazing thing because in Connecticut, it doesn't exist everywhere else in the country. A lot of places in the country, they can't pass a single law like a background check, like permits. Uh, so it is important to recognize that we have very good legislators here in Connecticut that are taking this seriously on both sides of the aisle. So without further ado, Representative Steve Stasher. Thank you, Jeremy. Th thanks to everyone for being here. You know, folks have said it, but it needs to be emphasized again. The sheer number of folks that come up to this building when we do public hearings on a day like today, when we hopefully, in the very, very, very near future, schedule a vote on these bills, come up, wear the t-shirts, walk around the buildings. Folks remember it, folks see it. They think twice before they hit that, that red or the green button on, on a vote when they see your face and it's the last thing they see before they go to vote. Your presence in this building is absolutely, absolutely critical. These bills, as folks know, uh, three of them have come out of the house, three of them come out of the, Judiciary and gone to the House once in the Senate. The House bills will be ready to take up for a vote as early as next week. We are. We are. We are, fi we are finalizing the last language, tweaking a word here, moving a comma there. 
As you've heard today, we've been engaged in bipartisan negotiations and bipartisan discussion because we want this to be the first session in as long as anybody can remember that Connecticut is not just going to pass one gun bill. The old one gun bill a session rule should be obliterated and this is the year we should do it. And with, all, and with all due respect to my friend and the former House Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, our Attorney General William Tong, I don't want 76 votes in the House. I don't want 19 votes in the Senate. We should get every last one of them. So in addition, so you did half your job by showing up, but here's your call to action for the rest of today. We need you to go and find your legislator, both your senator and your representative. If you can't find them, find somebody else who looks like a legislator. <laughs> find a staff member. Find a janitor. I don't care who you find. Talk to them and tell them about the importance of getting these bills called and getting these bills called soon. We don't just want legislators to commit to vote for these bills. Get them to commit to co-sponsor every last one of them. Every one of them. Get them to commit and go to their leadership, be it in the House or the Senate, and ask that the bills be called, the bills be called early in the session. And if they're a Republican, it's even more important. Ask them to go to their leadership and ask their leadership to push to limit debate on these bills so that we can get them called and we can get them called and done and put to bed early in the session. Because I don't mind. I'll stand on the House floor all night if I have to and talk about these bills because it's that important. But you know what? We shouldn't have to do that. We shouldn't allow certain members of this building to hijack the agenda on this issue and try to filibuster these bills. So don't just demand a yes vote. Don't just demand somebody co-sponsor. Demand someone go to their leadership and push to get these bills called and to get it done now. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I just want to thank Kate Martin. If you can come up here, Kate. You put a lot of hard work into this. So once again, we can't do this without you. We cannot do this without everyone in this room. All the advocates here, give yourselves a big round of applause. Absolutely. So if anyone's interested, we're going to be taking a photo immediately after this downstairs by the Nathan Hale statue. Um, and we will be sending that photo to every legislator so they know what they're up against if they decide to go the wrong way. But we know that they're committed. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.